first of all, it's been a very, very long time since the last time I had a talk in present. So I'm very, very happy about that. And as you will see, uh, I'm going to present something that interleaves very well with what Alessandra has told us, uh, especially for uh, uh, for the things about relevance assessment, in particular, implicit feedback, which is the thing that I would like to integrate in the in the in the task that I'm going to talk about. So, I've been working on uh, probabilistic models for text classification for a very long time, and in the recent past, I've moved to this very interesting research area about uh, uh, building systems for um, recall-oriented tasks. Okay, so uh, IR systems that need to retrieve most, if not all, the relevant items. So it's a quite different situation, and you will see that also the time that you have at your disposal, it's different, so you can think about different strategies and, and so on. So, uh, okay, so it's, so it's about not uh, retrieving all, or it's not about retrieving a few very good uh, items on top of the list. It's about having all the collections and catch them all, which means that you really want to uh, have a very, very high recall of objects that you're interested in. So how does this relate to the real, real world? Well, there are plenty of uh, colleagues that are working in, e-discovery in the legal domain in, and systematic reviews for, for in the health domain. So these are situations where you have to retrieve most, if not all, uh, for example, legal patents or prior cases in, um, in law or retrieve all the documents that are related to some specific medical condition before you take some decision. Uh, for example, the Cochrane, which is one of the largest uh, companies that perform systematic review, reviews in the health domain, uh, state in the, in the web page that these, uh, this work is intended to produce high quality, relevant, up to date systematic reviews uh, to have uh, an informed decision when you, when you have to take decisions. Okay. So for example, this is just uh, an idea of how this systematic review works. So you have time, a lot of time. You may have also uh, plenty of people working on the same, uh, on the same uh, topic. So for example, suppose that you want to retrieve all the documents in PubMed that are related to uh, low back pain. Okay, so you start, for example, with that query about disc herniation, then you retrieve a bunch of documents, which is around 2000 in this case. Now we have physicians, clinicians, uh, experts in the domain who actually read the documents. So you have time to read the document. You have time to rethink about uh, retrieving new documents or, or uh, differentiate the strategy of retrieval. And for example, you may have missed something and then you change the query. So for example, the physical examination for lumbar radiculopathy, which is another uh, situation for low back pain. Then you have 600 or something more documents to retrieve and then you go on. So the question is, when do you stop? And that's the problem for, uh, that we are going to talk about today. So I'm going to divide this talk in three parts. The first part is about continuous active learning. So it's a, it's a way that, it's a strategy that you can use and it's being shown to, to work very, very well in these recall oriented tasks where you retrain your model as soon as you have new information. Because remember, you have the time to do that. It's not like a usual or traditional search engine where you search something, you read, and then you're done. Here you have a document, you have time to read documents, and maybe while the, the expert is reading the document, you can retrain your system according to the, to the previous feedback. Then the second part is about how you estimate recall with limited resources. And this is one of the problem. Also, when we in this uh, research area uh, evaluate things, we sometimes uh, forget the fact that we have limited resources in, in real and in the real world. And then the, the last part is about what we are doing currently about query variant performance prediction. 
So what is continuous active learning? So just to give you a very uh, brief idea of how this works, this is just uh, a sketch of how things work or may work. It's not exactly this in, in every time, not all the researchers uh, uh, perform this strategy, it could be slightly different, but this is the main idea. So we have this collection of documents, five documents in this case, then you have your user with a query, for example, search something for low back pain. Then your IR system rank these documents, which is different from the one, two, three, four, five ranking. Then the user re reads the document, gives some explicit relevance feedback. Then you store this feedback and then the system has the time to re-rank everything if you want to. Then you also can work in batches of documents. So for example, some strategies use five, 10, 20 documents before re-updating everything. But I'm, uh, I really have to see these cases where you need batches of documents or maybe you need an experimental evaluation to check whether five, 10 or one document is better than a set of documents. Then the user uh, again uh, answers with positive or negative feedback. In, in this talk, I will talk about binary relevance feedback. So it's either relevant or non-relevant, but all, of course you can, uh, you can use also a graded relevance. Then you, again, and you go on and go on, okay? So that's the main idea. So you formulate the query, then you rank uh, the documents or the remaining uh, documents in the collection, assess, and then you get, and then you give feedback. And then you continue to do this until, remember that you want, we want to catch them all. And that's the problem. The problem is, when do we stop? Okay, so continuous active learning is a way to retrain the model according to the immediate relevance feedback that you have. The problem is, how do you know that you have obtained most of the relevant objects in the collection? So the second part is about estimate recall with limited resources, and that's the, the difficult part. So remember the limited resources here may be, or there may be also other uh, resources that I can think of. So it's time and money is the first two. So if you have a limited amount of time to read a document or to finish the task, you have to take into consideration that. If you have a limited amount of money to pay the, the expert or the clinician or uh, the, the legal expert, you have to take into account that. You do not have always these unlimited amount of resources. So every time you judge something, you should take uh, into account the fact that you may finish at some point the money or the time needed to evaluate and to assess the collection. So how do we build an effective system given maybe a limited time or a limited amount of money or both, which makes sense, right? So it's a question of balancing the fact that maybe we want uh, a system which is good to retrieve uh, soon the relevant documents. But remember that when you do that, you're not actually capable directly to estimate how many relevant documents are still in the collection, okay? So you may go the other way around. So why don't we start sampling in maybe in some clever way, not just random sampling, maybe in a different way. So that I can at some point know that 10% of the collection will contain relevant documents. So if I know the total number of documents, I can do some very simple math and say, okay, if I have 100 documents, 10 documents will be relevant. But so far as in this example, I needed to judge 10 or 11 documents to say that I need 10 more relevant documents and I still need to find them. So I have to spend some time to estimate the recall. Is it enough or is it okay to do that? So it's a balance between the two. So it's a, a kind of guessing how much do you have to gamble in one way or another? You have to do, there is a subtopic here, which is com not completely different from the rest of this talk, but it's very, very interesting to, to think about this problem in how do I optimize the resources to build 
the most efficient system that will balance the estimation of the recall and the number of relevant documents that I can retrieve. So we can need, we may add this sampling uh, bar, and I refer now to uh, a very recent paper by uh, Lee and Canulas from University of Amsterdam, or TOYS. So as you can see, there is a ranking module, as just as I uh, showed you. Then there is a clever sampling module where you have an inclusion probability. So it's a probability distribution of picking documents, which is not uniformly distributed over, I don't know, maybe 1 million documents. It's just proportional, let's say, to the rank of the document. So it's, it's easier and it's clever. Do, then you assess. Then you have the estimation module. At this point, you are able, with some level of uncertainty, to, to say how many relevant documents are still in the collection. And then you can uh, improve this estimation by adding more samples. And then you decide at this point if you have to stop or not. So this is a very interesting approach uh, to balance the fact that you want relevant documents as soon as possible, at the same time to be sure that you have reached uh, um, some, levels, uh, some level of accuracy. On the other hand side, uh, uh, we developed this uh, very, I don't know, greedy uh, approach where it was like catch them all. So let's try to sweep all the documents that I have in the collection that is in an area which is favorable in terms of relevance. So this is the two-dimensional probabilistic model that I've worked that have been working on forever now. It's just a traditional probabilistic model where instead of uh, one number which usually represents the uh, the ratio of the likelihood, you split this into in the two numbers in the two log odds that you have. And you plot these two numbers in this two-dimensional space, and you are able to see things that usually you, you don't see with probabilistic model. And you see shapes in these two-dimensional models where you have, for example, in this case, uh, green dots that represent relevant documents, red dots, the non-relevant documents, and black dots are uh, the remaining documents in the collection. So there are areas in this two-dimensional uh, space that are more favorable for looking or for sampling relevant documents. So it, here it's simply, let's try to sweep all the most favorable area and then we stop when, when we finish the morning. So the idea of our approach is, okay, I fix a number of documents that I'm able to read and then I stop no matter what. It's 100, 100, 500, 1000. But at that point, I cannot go further than that because I finished the resources. So we try to compare these two uh, approaches. These are just the trends of uh, our approach compared to this baseline, which is the, the baseline uh, of two runs provided by uh, the colleagues by University of Amsterdam. So it's a collection of one, uh, 100,000 documents with 50 queries. It was um, a medical uh, task, so retrieving documents about medical conditions. So here we can see that the, the very good baseline uh, used around 28,000 uh, documents to reach a recall, an average recall of zero point. So it's 85% up to 90%, which is good, right? And it's this approach uh, is able to tell you that, okay, so you are very confident about the fact that you have reached 90% of recall for each of the topics. Okay, so you are confident about that. On the other hand side, it's the other approach. So let's try to sweep all the space of relevant documents, for example, 200, 600 per query, 1000 per query, and so on. So if we stop here of all the experiments that we have done, we are more or less around the same amount of documents compared to the baseline. And it's interesting to see that this approach, which is, I would call it greedy because it's just go in this direction no matter what even it's favorable but you don't know anything about the number of relevant documents on average performs much better much better okay it's 
89 against 0.94 recall. But if you think about it, it's very, very hard when you are very close to 100% to get that, that 1% more. So it's 5% uh, difference, but, and it takes more or less the same amount of money, uh, money or resources, okay? The problem here is that on average, uh, this greedy approach perform better than the other, but I cannot guarantee that I, um, for example, I can tell to um, uh, the, the physician that he, oh, I'm sure that I have reached 90%. I cannot tell that. I just know that in this particular situation, if you give me 1,000 tokens of resources, I'm able to perform very well, but I don't know how many relevant documents I've, I've missed. On the other hand, I know that there are still something missing, but I can tell you how many I have missed. Or vice versa. I can also say that I can reach more or less the same level of accuracy, 90%, by reducing uh, by 50%. So instead of reading 25,000 documents, okay, let's put one euro for one document each. So I've spent 25,000 euros. What if I tell you, okay, I can give you the same accuracy with a little bit of uncertainty with instead of 25,000 euros with 18,000 euros. So it's a lot of money that you can say, however, you have some uncertainty. So in some cases, this uncertainty is not tolerable. And so you have to balance these two, uh, these two, these two approaches. So here are just numbers of these experiments that, that we have done in the past. And it's interesting because the, the approach of uh, estimating recall, it's also much better in retrieving uh, good relevant documents at the beginning, at the top of the, of the ranking list, or the first K documents that you read, much, much better than the other approach. But at some point, it decreases while the continuous, the greedy continuous active learning uh, keeps rolling, 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 and keeps uh, gathering relevant documents until you have more, on average, more relevant documents compared to these, these other approaches. So it's, again, it's not one better than the other, absolutely. It's just you have to think about how you, um, you can balance these two approaches according to the limited amount of resources. This is, I'm stressing uh, this, part, um, this part because it's usually, uh, um, usually we, we forget the problem of limited resources or how we evaluate things in the real life. So third part, it's about uh, a different approach that we have been uh, studying. And I will talk to you, uh, and I will tell you something about this uh, in, in a moment, about how you can uh, bet on some of the variant um, of the queries that you can reformulate. So suppose that you have an information need and you start thinking about how I can express this information need using queries. Maybe you come up with 10 variants. Is there a way to say which of these 10 variants is better than the others if I have to start collecting documents? Because if so, I have a, uh, I starting in a favorable situation where I start retrieving more relevant documents at the beginning, then I can use this information earlier, much earlier. So it's about, instead of having just one query, try different query reformulation and have different ranks. Now, of course, you can perform postdoc evaluation. So suppose that you actually run this experiment using different queries, you have relevance judgment, you use evaluation collection like in track, play. Uh, so you can do this in a postdoc way, but how about doing this beforehand? So are you able to predict which one of these reformulations will perform uh, better than the other? Or can you order them? in decreasing order of for some uh, relevance uh, measure. So this is a very nice work by, by Zucon and others uh, from CIR 2018. 
It's about failure variation performance prediction. So uh, that's the problem stated, but I have just said that. And there are diff many approaches for, for trying to estimate these uh, query performance prediction. And these methods can be pre-retrieval predictors. So things that are uh, stored, let's say, in the, in the statistics of the collection. And then you can use that to make a prediction or also post-retrieval. So first you rank. You don't use any relevance assessment, but you try to see according to the, for example, the frequency of the turns in the top K rank documents, whether uh, there's any information that you can use to predict the, uh, the effectiveness of that theory. So there are plenty of them. And in this work, you can see a lot of uh, comparison about these approaches. But, and this is one part. And then for, uh, a work that, I, that we have been doing in the, uh, in the last few weeks. We started from this very intriguing approach that was presented at CIR 2016 by Wimoto and others, which is called Sandbar. And it was uh, a user interface and an approach to suggest a user during the search. This re resembles a little bit what uh, Alessandro was, uh, uh, was telling us about uh, a few moments ago about how to guide the user doing the search visually also, okay? So suppose that you have the, uh, the information in the mind. You have the information in the user, which is smoking cigarette, right? But we don't know actually what is the intent of the user until we see some feedback from him, right? So it could be, for example, uh, smoking cigarettes related to um, probability of, uh, of cancer, lung cancer, or could be much easier. Um, it's about smoking or the price of the cigarettes. We don't know until we have some feedback from the user, right? So the, the nice thing about this approach called scent bar is that the user has these colored bars with different query variations proposed by the user and also by the system automatically. And then you have these colored bars where uh, the user uh, has the possibility to see an estimate of how much information you still have to uh, look for in order to, for example, complete the task of uh, retrieving information about smoke, smoking cancer risk and so on. So this is a very nice way to see different aspects of the same information need and how much information there is uh, missing in the collection. Okay, and so they define, and also previous work before that, define the intent aware gain metric. So you have the importance of a document, which means that documents that are relevant for a central aspect among all the possible aspects of the same query, uh, the most important aspects uh, must be weighted more than the other. So these are just, uh, initial hypothesis or principles that you can use to define this gain metric. Then of course, a highly relevant documents produce higher, higher gain than partially relevant ones, which is reasonable. And also this last one is a little bit different from the usual. It's a call, it's uh, something similar to uh, diversity in IR. So suppose that you already have seen some of these uh, relevant documents. If you see at this point a relevant document in the cigarette price increase, maybe this is more important for the user compared to yet another relevant document for disease caused by smoking. So it's the question of novelty. So it's that differentiating the results. So it's a relevant document, relevant for one uh, peripheral high. Um, peripheral aspect could be at some point in time more useful than others, okay? So these are the general principles of this metric. Uh, so just to summarize before, before I go into the just two slides of uh, uh, formula that I had in this presentation. So you have the topic, the, the central topic that the user is uh, looking for. Then you have the subtopic, so the different variants of the topic. And these variants, these subtopics can be clustered. And the most important 
subtopic is called aspect. Okay, so these are the query aspects. Okay, so within each cluster, you have one of the, the subtopic which is more important than the others for some reason or some metric. Okay, so that's the that's the setting. So how do you measure the importance of a subtopic without having any relevant uh, information beforehand? Okay, so it's a question of comparing the ranking of the uh, reference topic T of the user. So the, the, we have a reference topic T in this framework and one, two, three, four, five, it's the ranking of these five documents. While one of these subtopics has this particular ranking, okay? So the importance of a subtopic just uh, takes the intersection of these documents and uses that formula, which is one over the rank of the documents to and the sum of these ranks to, to compute the importance. So the more the subtopic uh, contains documents that are ranked by the uh, reference topic, the more important is the subtopic. And also among all the possible aspects or subtopics, the, we have a formulation of a probability of that aspect given a topic, which is just a, a weighted average. So the more important that, uh, is a topic, the, the, the highest probability for that topic, for that aspect, sorry. And then we have this, which is the, the most important part of this uh, talk about query uh, performance prediction, which is the gain. So the gain of a, given a reference topic and one aspect and given a collection of documents that you have retrieved the gain is given by one which is the maximum gain that you can get minus some products of elements of single elements that which are given by the amount of relevance that that document can give you okay so you subtract elements or bits of relevance according to how much this document is relevant and this relevance is computed in this way. It's easier than it seems. So it's just take all the uh, all the subtopics within a cluster. For each subtopic in the cluster, you compute the importance of that subtopic and you multiply it on in the numerator by the relevance of that document. So if it's higher in each list of the subtopic, this relevancy will be higher. If it's lower in the rank, this will be lower. How do we compute this relevance as given D? It's just one over the square root of the rank of that document. So as you can see, we are not using any relevance feedback here. We are just using statistics and positions in the ranks in order to try to get an estimate of how much uh, information we can obtain from that particular set of documents and that particular aspect. And this is just the final formula of the intent aware gain that is used by SENPAR to compute those, uh, those color bars. Now we started from this uh, and we started thinking, well, can we use this formula to, uh, as a proxy for query performance prediction? So uh, in the work of by Umamoto and others, so the SENPAR work, they define the amount of misinformation in order to uh, color the, the, those bars and say what could have happened if the user had crossed more documents. Instead, we want to use this, the same information to, uh, to predict whether one of the reformulation is more, uh, could be more accurate than the others according to some measure. So we uh, have been submitted this work together with Guillermo Fagioli, one of the PhD students of the group. And you can read the preprint version of this of this paper. So there are two important things that is missing, if not information is that missing from this uh, problem. If you want to uh, use that in a recall oriented task, so usually if you think about it, you do not have this reference topic. You may have some in uh, some evaluation uh, data sets, some reference topic, but because just. The data sets it's built in, in that way, but usually when you are when you have users that interact with your system, you do not have a reference topic. You have multiple reformulations, and you don't know whether uh, there is a reference topic or not. We know that the user have, has some information in mind, 
but we don't know any reference topic. And we, uh, our hypothesis is that for this particular task that we are talking about, systematic re reviews, we have one single cluster of query variants. So we have one particular um, uh, uh, cluster of aspects that we are interested in, and we do not have uh, different uh, variants of the same uh, of the same uh, topic. So these are uh, our two initial hypotheses, and we just changed a little bit the, the, the notation, but nothing important here. So I will skip this. But one thing is important. I will, I will talk to you about it. Will show you the, the results. So in the game formulation, as you can see, we have one minus the product of a uh, of a series of numbers given a collection of document uh, capital T. So if you think about it, this is one minus a number, which is the, the, the relevance of the document, which is between zero and one. So in general, you will have a product of numbers between zero and one. So in general, you have n multiplications of small numbers. So if, you, if D is large enough, the problem of the game defined in that way is that it, that it will separate one automatically because it's going to be one minus 0 0.2 times 0 0.3 times 0 0.4. If you do it 100 times, it's going to be zero, the product numerically. So we have a separation that goes to one very, very quickly uh, with this uh, formulation. So we changed it a little bit to see what, what happens if we perform a mean of the game instead of this product. The idea is the same. So you try to average those relevances instead of multiplying them. And one last thing be, be, before I show you uh, what happens uh, with, with experiments, it's uh, going back to the idea that there might be an aspect. So there might be one of, one of the reformulations which is more important than the other, even though you don't, you don't know what is or if there is a reference topic. So what we have thought about was to build a similarity matrix uh, among the different query variants, but just uh, uh, building up this matrix of V reformulation and D documents, where D documents is the intersection of all the documents retrieved by at least one reformulation. So it's just, uh, if you have five reformulation, it's a matrix of five times all the documents that have been retrieved by at least this formulation. And, when, and then we, each value of this uh, matrix is defined as the number of columns of this, um, of this matrix minus the rank of the document of that particular query. So it's a sort of approach to say, okay, let's see uh, what is the distribution of these ranks for each reformulation. And the idea is that we may find some reformulation which is closer than the others. And the reformulation that is closer to most of the other query formulation will be what we consider the, the centroid of this matrix of variants. And we will use information. So just to give you an idea, at the end, if you have three formulations, this is going to be a, um, a symmetric matrix where the first formulation, we use cosine distance between this reformulation. For example, the first formulation compared to the second formulation, it's close 0 0.2, according to a cosine distance similarity, and 0 0.4 with uh, uh, reformulation three. So we just compute the sum of the rows or the columns, it's the same, and order the reformulations according to the sum. So what we obtain with that it's an estimate of how close is one reformulation to the others. And we hypothesize that the closest, I mean, the, the variance which is closer to the others will be more uh, likely to gather more relevant doc documents just because it, it, it's, it's in between all the possible reformulations. So it's more favorable in, in that sense. And we will use this uh, reverse order to to say whether one topic is better than the other. So we, uh, we try to, uh, to, uh, to see whether these approaches 
uh, works or to use the gain metric and the, the, the variance of the gain metric in a recall-oriented task. So we use the, the CLE 2018 eHealth Consumer and Search task. There are 50 information needs with seven query formulation each. We do not have a reference topic. I mean, there is a reference topic, but we did not use this reference topic. There are more than 5 million document uh, crawled using a subset of common crawl. And we also have, of course, uh, about 500 relevant assessment for information needs. So we started by running uh, some traditional query uh, prediction performance. And here you can see in just a few of them that are related to the, to the paper by Zucon and others. So just to see whether traditional query performance predictors can uh, predict which of the query uh, will perform better in the future. In this first example, we did not uh, perform uh, intratopic query performance, which means that we took the 50 um, variants and we ordered them according to um, the recall. And then we compared them to the actual order of the same 50 queries using relevance assessment. And as you can see, uh, this is the Kendall Tau uh, correlation with the optimal or with the true order of these 50, and we have a significant correlation with this uh, ranking. So for the intertopic traditional uh, query performance predictors work uh, well, or at least they can tell you, they can order the topics in, in, in a reasonable way. On the other hand, just zooming a little bit, for intratopic traditional uh, query performance prediction is does not give any correlation. So this means that if I take the seven reformulation and try to uh, order them according to one of the traditional query performance predictor, I do not get any correlation at all with the true ranking, the, the true optimal ranking. So this is not uh, useful. Now this is the we are still debating this with our colleagues because. It's exactly at the opposite of the paper of Zucon and others. So we are going to check, but it's a different collection. So we are going to check whether the collection can impact um, this. But the, um, the, the idea here is that if you use traditional query performance predictor, it, it's not, um, I mean, at least for this data set, I can tell you that it's not useful in the sense that you cannot say anything about which uh, variant will perform better. So we try to uh, um, do the same experiment with the original gain by Momo and others applied to the query performance prediction with the average gain that uh, tries to solve the problem of the saturation one and the similarity based gain. So the interesting thing is that there is a good correlation with the original gain, but the the strange thing, which is not strange once you understand the fact that there is a saturation, if you increase the cutoff, so the cutoff means that I'm looking at the first 100, 1,000, 10,000 documents. So I'm going deeper in the list of the ranked documents. The, the correlation decreases, which means, which is uh, a little bit odd because you are adding information to the, to the system and you're less able to predict which very uh, query variation is better than the other. Instead, if we, if, we, if we correct the saturation problem, we increase the correlation, which means that I add more information and I give the information to the system and the system is able to predict better which are uh, the, the, most, uh, the most favorable uh, query variation and the similarity base game, which works even better. So just one last thing about uh, to show you how the gain saturates one very quickly, here on the top part of the graph, you have the 350 queries. It's 50 information needs times seven reformulation. And as you can see, for less than 50 queries, we have a reasonable difference in the value of the gain. While for the rest, for the remaining 300, which it's almost one or practically one. And this makes the correlation 
also difficult, if not impossible, to, to compute because we do not have any difference between, um, between the, the query variants. And that is the problem of the original game. This is the average game that we propose. So as you can see, it's smooth across the 350. And here at the bottom part, you can see the blue dots, which represent which are the topics for which the correlation with the optimal uh, ranking of the topics is significant. So it means that we can predict uh, with a very good uh, accuracy which topics, uh, which variants perform better. And that's for the, for the similarity metrics, which is also even, even better in terms of uh, correlation. This is just one last slide to show you all the possible uh, combinations that we perform. So as a final remark to conclude, we saw that traditional query performance predictors uh, are not that accurate, but it's, it's debated right now for recall-oriented tasks. So it means that this approach may not work as well as we may expect. On the other hand, we transformed uh, a, a game metric, which was intended for finding the missing information in a user perspective, and we used that to, uh, to build a system that um, predicts the performance of a query. And we um, also propose a couple of alternatives to this um, game function, and in, we uh, improved significantly the prediction at least in terms of the, uh, the correlation with, a, with the optimal solution. So where do we go from here? So now I told you about the fact that with an um, initial greedy approach, we were able to retrieve a lot of relevant documents without knowing whether we uh, were missing some relevant or how many relevant documents we were missing. This was, we needed to counterbalance this with um, a sampling approach. Now, I'm adding this problem of the fact that you may use some optimal strategies to pick some of these uh, query variations and maybe start jumping from one reformulation to the other according to, to some strategy. You can do that because now I can show you that you have. Uh, a way to estimate the importance of each query formulation. So this is all a uh, work in progress and I'm happy to, to take questions. One uh, advertised uh, advertisement slide, there are special issues now together with Evangelos Canulas. We are trying to get momentum on this particular topic. So we have one special issue at the Intelligent Systems with Application Sensor here. It's about technological, uh, technology assisted review systems. We have just obtained a deadline extension. So we have uh, still more than one month. And then we have a research topic at Frontiers, which is more about evaluation metrics and protocols for high recall IR systems. So we, we welcome you to, uh, to submit uh, proposals and manuscripts to this very exciting research area. As you can see, it's a little bit different than the traditional IR, high precision IR, but it's very interesting. So thank you very much. And if you have questions, thank you. Thank you, So are there questions from home? I mean, online? Uh, no, no, super clear. Thank you. No questions here in the room? No, great. I mean, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we like questions, yes. Questions? Great, Alessandro, please. So first of all, thank you for your talk, very interesting. In what they are. Okay, oh, okay, you can come here. Okay, perfect. So my question is about the matrix similarity mm -hmm. for queries, for emulation. Yes. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more how you calculate the cosine distance? So what is the vector like? Just a bag of words? Or no, that, that it's, it's even simpler, so I didn't spend much time on that. So every um, yeah. cell in that matrix, so suppose that you, the first row is the first reformulation, and the n columns are the n documents retrieved. It's an intersection of all the documents retrieved by all the, the variants. Then each cell is the difference between 
the number of columns, which is the size of the matrix, minus the original ranking in the first variation, which means that we are trying to rebuild a sort of re-ranked of these documents, but it's just used to compare this set of numbers. So it's not the FIDF, it's, it, it's normalized with L2, this matrix. But at the end, it's just comparing the sequence of numbers in this vector space of rankings to see whether one reformulation is closer, closer than the others in terms of documents that have been ranked close to the others. So, so the idea is that if there is a reformulation which uh, rank documents, let's say similarly to reformulation two, reformulation three and four, it may be more uh, promising in terms of relevance because it captures all the variations. So that's the idea. So it's uh, trying to capture the reformulations that tries to uh, keep all the documents of all the other reformulations. That's the basic idea. Okay, so a high score means you have very similar at least. Yes. At least one. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, a high score in yes. the cosines means that the rank list of yes. one reformulation is very close exactly. in terms of the Okay, yes. thank you. Cool. Okay, uh, Giorgio, we have a question. Yes. Paul, and we can read it. So, uh, Daniel Ebers, if you want to, you, you can ask the question live if you want. No, well, uh, basically, there is a lot of material to digest. The question yes. is, is there something to read? Now, I shared the slide on, um, on SlideShare. If you go to on Twitter, I shared the slides. And in the slides, you have the some of the references that, that I put. And uh, I can give you also some other, I mean, the four or five papers that I've mentioned in these slides that are in the slides contain a lot of uh, background material, especially the, the work by Evangelos and uh, Guido Canulas and Zucon. Uh, you have plenty of material you can start with. And also our work, but it's, uh, I think with these three or four papers, you can start. Uh, looking around, but and if you need more, just drop me an email, and I will be happy to to give additional pointers. Yeah, the webcam is there. So, yeah. Yes, sorry, <laughs> okay. myself. Sorry, yes. <laughs> Thank you.